One Berlin. Welcome to Radio One Berlin. I'm Adrian Shepard, and in the studio today, Jason Oni and Nicholas Schreck with an unopened vinyl and an exclusive world first interview with Paul Rossler from the seminal LA electro punk band The Screamers. Gentle mention, over to you. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in to Radio One Berlin. This is Jason Honey. I am Boy True, a.k.a. The Shitty Listener. I'm sitting next to Nicholas Schreck. Hello there, everybody. And it is with unbridled joy that we get to do a special feature on L.A.'s Screamers. Um, we have a copy of the album here. Um, it's a bunch of their demos, six, five or six songs to be exact, recorded back in 1978. Um, finally released as a vinyl album by Superior Viaduct. Um, I don't think uh, the Screamers really require any kind of grand introduction. If you're listening to this because of Screamers, and you probably already know something about them. However, for anyone who doesn't, just so you know, the Screamers are a seminal, um, very important sort of mask era L.A. punk rock band, uh, notorious for their live performances, hyperdynamic, full of energy and loud um, who back in the day, out of all of those bands, never actually released anything. An interesting concept was to actually release a video album. Um, of course, that never really took off, took off. And now, years after the fact, as I mentioned, we have this little... Uh, so hold, I'm holding in my hands the first official release from seminal Los Angeles punk band The Screamers. As the label says, recorded in 1977. 77, okay. This classic Lost EP features two keyboards, live drums, and Tomato Duplenty's frantic vocals, mastered from the original reel to reel. And um, we're going to open it, if oh. you will do the honors. Should I open this thing? Okay, it has and, not yet been opened. Right, and I should point out that Paul Rossler, who we will be interviewing shortly, was one of several of the keyboardists for the Screamers, and I was a huge aficionado of the Screamers when they were active from 1977 to 1980. I saw many, many of their shows. Uh, I befriended Tomato Duplenty, who became somewhat of a mentor to me, and uh, we will shortly, uh, after we open the Screamers album, which was a long-awaited artifact that never happened in their lifetime it's taken some 40 something years before there was an actual screamers album it's open it is now open and we're going to read a little bit of the liner notes from it oh boy look at that look at that look at that okay lordy where do we even start slash are you a punk band in parentheses long silence tomata wouldn't say so Slash, afraid to be a punk band? Tomata, it's really a press thing. I would just say we make sounds. Slash, volume one, number two, June 1977. These songs were recorded a few months after the Los Angeles punk scene began. These five statements of intent transcend punk and project forward into the future to the analog synth wave of the late 70s and beyond to the present day, four decades later, when they finally receive an official release. Sourced from the original reel-to-reels, they are a revelation compared to the countless copies that have been circulating by multiple generations of tape traders. Here, for the first time, is the Screamer's initial and legendary manifesto. So, to begin with... uh we will play Punish and Be Damned by the Screamers. And this was a demo recording, one of their very few professionally recorded um, attempts at capturing their sound, which they never were totally satisfied that they had. But we are going to play it right now for you. So this is Punish and Be Damned by the Screamers from 1977. Okay, so here it goes. All right, if I can see in this blinding winter sunlight. Here we go. She got 
The Screamers, Punish and Be Damned, recorded July 7th, 1977, and Mick September 14th, 1977, and the lineup of The Screamers at that point was Tomato Duplenty on vocals, Tommy Gear on the ARP Odyssey synthesizer and vocals, and the keyboard player for this formation of The Screamers was David Brown on Fender Rhodes, K.K. Barrett, and drums. And then shortly thereafter this recording, our guest tonight, Paul Rossler, became the keyboard player. And there were several formations of the Screamers, but he was the longest-lasting of the Screamers keyboardists. So before we segue into the interview, um, we're going to play a poem that I wrote for a memorial exhibition of Tomato de Plenty's art that was held in Los Angeles in 2014. And this is called Trippin' with the Leprechaun, and it's about an acid trip that he and I took at Hollywood Memorial Cemetery in the early 1980s, and it reflects on our relationship. So, Trippin' with the Leprechaun, a poem that I wrote for a memorial exhibition of his art in 2014. Can't wait to hear it again. This time, let's do it at Fairbanks' tomb. You take one half, I'll take the other. Hey, it's August. Maybe the lady in black left a bouquet for the chic. Feel anything yet? Or is it just the heat? You never know with this street shit. It's hitting hard at the rocket tomb. Escape the sun and the gaslight's gloom. That our tow book we nabbed from the library's under your shirt. Add a cocktail or two to our caper. What? I can't hear you over those shrieking strippers. So you're a Coney Island baby, you say? Yeah, in the dim light I can see you as a 19th century escapee from the sideshow funhouse. Everything's different now. When we first met, a southern born-again peanut farmer was in office. Now a right-wing Hollywood dictator's got his finger on the bomb. Back then, the artsiest stoner girl from pottery class trudges with me through gray high school corridors. Like convicts awaiting summer parole, she shows me the contraband. Your contorted grimace on the hot-off-the-presses slash. Get a load of this guy. It may be crude ink dots on cheap white newsprint, but my world's exploding in a riot of color. 
One look at your manic mug, an Egon Sheila etching, twitching in straight-jacketed electroshock, and I know that the days of the Eagles, Foghat, and Frampton are over at last. Slash says you sing for the one and only group in this galaxy to have done away with guitars and other lame gimmicks. That's what got me, before I even hear a single note. Whispers of war from Clockwork Orange London and the bankrupt Bowery. One look at you and I understand. Revolutions reached La La Land, nodding out in her quaalude slumber. Sunday after school let out, Rodney's radio voice whines, The screamers will be at the whiskey. Summer solstice sacrifice. I'm slashing off my long hippie hair, donning a black foul leather jacket, one of my dog's collars buckled around my neck, rushing to meet my tomboy doppelganger dream date at Licorice Pizza, where a towering cadaver called Kim tells us he's pissed off because the fucking screamers canceled their gig due to illness. Whatever bacteria made you sick that day, it wasn't half as bad as the germs I had to sit through instead. Your no-show's adding mojo to your mystique, confirmed in full when I catch your fireworks on the 4th of July. The future's finally here. Shiny would sweat, your voice is hoarse now, from shouting about Ava, Dolores, and Twiggy. You make sneering Tommy Gear give me a beer, and tell me with a disarming grin that you really dig the black vinyl shirt I bought at the pleasure chest. In between enthusing about Nico, Noy, and Goblin, and setting out your dream of world domination through video intimidation, you're becoming my agony aunt, whose dear Abby advice eases my adolescent angst. In that bomb shelter under the pussycat, your face becomes a madman's mask, a new form of mutant life spawned from the coming Third World War. That tab we split in the crypt shot me a Rumpelstiltskin revelation. You've been an undercover leprechaun all along, a creature from the fairy realm on an obscure elfish mission, leaving us mortals with visions of a better world, where everybody would be made to feel important. I leave you a wilted Wilton Hilton gorilla rose at your ashes and an icy wall. You are Hollywood forever. Wow. Well, what do you have to say for yourself? Well, I think that speaks for how important the Screamers and Tomata and the whole experience was to me. And I think as we get into our interview with Paul, we'll actually touch on some of those incidents that happened. But um, yeah, they, you know, to me, they were the best live act I've ever seen, really, without any competition. And um, yeah, and I wanted to write that poem as a tribute to him when this memorial was held in Los Angeles, which actually Paul played some Screamer songs at. Got it. Yeah. As I mentioned a little bit ago when we were talking, uh, after we both posted on social media that we were working on the show, I got PM'd by a bunch of people and was reminded by somebody in San Francisco that uh, even though I knew who the Screamers were, the first time I ever actually heard them because somebody had a cassette of them that I could listen to um, and explained to me that what was neat about them was that there wasn't a guitar in the band, okay? Um, also then quickly added that from time to time there would be a guitar that Tomato would maybe not necessarily play, but would use uh, to make noises or to bang on things yes, and stuff he, like that. Yes, he would use a, a processed guitar almost as an adjunct to his synthesizer. He, But, I mean, I am uh, are in the ardent minority of people who are, who are devoted guitar haters, so I was very happy to see a band that had absolutely none of this novelty instrument, the electric guitar, but he did occasionally use it as a kind of avant-garde, you know, accessory, but he didn't, you know, use it in the traditional way. Got it, yeah. And um, it gets mentioned in the interview that you're about to hear in a minute, uh, that towards the end, and I believe you actually witnessed this, um, at the whiskey, I think, mm. there was 
there was a review on stage, one woman, several women who were singing along yeah, with the band? Yeah, when, when the Screamers began, when I, I saw them at the Starwood, I believe it was July 4th of 77, they were very stripped down and very ex- almost like something from an expressionist German silent movie, you know, very minimal and bare. But they were so charismatic, they commanded the stage completely. And then as in in the v- relatively brief time of their career, they then held a sold out, I believe it was a three or four day stand at the Whiskey A Go Go. They had come back after having vanished for a while. And when they came back, it was with an elaborate, almost honestly a little bit kitschy Las Vegas review type thing with a female singer and... Uh, they uh, added violin and a few other classical yeah. instruments, as I recall. And it honestly, it lost some of the power that the original formation had. It was still interesting, and it still looked like it was going in a, you know, musically in an interesting direction by adding the classical pieces. But it did, it sort of lost focus. And Tomata was such an intensely charismatic frontman, he really didn't need any extra drama but this went back to his i think his um initial embryonic career performances in the coquettes which was a a, do tell yeah a drag queen hippie drag queen act that performed in san francisco and new york and so the screamers were starting to get into that kind of theatricality but at first it was just tomata totally commanded the stage on his own but you know i still remember those they were still going in some direction that no other rock band was going in but i don't think the final stage of the screamers was quite successful And even though they still were very popular and they never did release this video album that they they kept promising to release, that would be, you know, they presented themselves as the future of of music. And, you know, it may maybe it just needed to be this very brief comet that that crashed. Sure. And speaking of that raw. Uh, unbridled energy that you were just referring to a couple of minutes ago. Why don't we listen to another track, uh, Peer Pressure, and then I have a couple of questions I would like to ask you. Yeah? So this is The Screamers, Peer Pressure on the 1977 uh, Superior Viaduct uh, demos album. Here we go. from my peers Some of them are straight and some of them are queers Some of them are black and some of them are white Some of them are wrong and some of them are right
Well, yippee i I'm reminded of uh, a certain someone who used to play drums in a certain band I used to be in. And every time we'd go on stage and he'd see all those uniform-looking punk rockers out there, he would stand up behind his drum set and go, Peer Pressure! Peer Pressure! Peer well, that, pressure. that, uh, that <laughs> song, Peer Pressure, uh, have, <laughs> having been... You know, in the mask and in the early <laughs> punk scene in Hollywood, the I don't look back at it with any great nostalgia because that song captured this feeling of almost Stalinist conformism that really very quickly dominated the punk scene. Like, I remember there were these girls that knew Darby Crash, part of his mini Jonestown, and... Um, <laughs> If if any guy came into the mask, this tiny little this this bomb shelter. club that I referred to in my poem as a bomb shelter under a porno movie theater, uh, they would actually have scissors ready to cut their hair because they you know you wouldn't be allowed in to the mask if you had long hair, which I had a few months before. You know, none of punk rock didn't exist. And then suddenly it did, but then you had to conform in this almost communist way to the look and, you know, the right shoes. And it became very quickly a distorted reflection of the worst things about mainstream society that it sought to escape from. Yep. And that and peer, that song, Peer Pressure, though I think it went back to the Screamers' earlier version called The Tupperwares in Seattle. I was just going to ask you that. Yeah, I think that Tomato wrote that earlier, but it to it very much was a, applied as a commentary, which all the early punks in Hollywood were quickly aware of, is this whole experimentation and, and new approach to things very quickly became very dominated by peer pressure. You have to look like this, you're a poser if you don't do this, and and it was very unwelcoming to new people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had a very nasty, clique-like attitude. And uh, speaking of somebody who didn't have any hair and probably didn't submit to too much peer pressure and was in the Cockettes or was in the backup band for the Tupperwares was Il Duce, right. who was buddies with Duplenty, right? And, yes, uh, El, El Duce, Eldon Hoke, who was also a friend of mine, um, he, he, he was the founder of The Mentors, the... Um, the band that he formed, which which billed itself proudly as Rape Rock, which probably wouldn't go over too good these days. Mm -hmm. um, and El Duce knew Tomata. They could not have been more different than each other, but they had been friends since they were in Seattle. And, and El Duce actually played drums with uh, some of the earlier formations that Tomata and Tommy Gear had in Seattle. So they knew each other, and El Duce was the MC at the Ivar Theater, and there was a stripper that I was dating. The Ivar Theater was a, the lowest level burlesque theater in Hollywood, which is saying something. <laughs> Although maybe Jumbo's Clown <coughs> was even worse. But, mm -hmm. but so... We went there, Tomato and Jumbo's I, together, clown. as I referred to in the poem, because he knew El Duce, and El Duce would introduce the girls in his growling, uh, alcoholic voice in the most obscene way possible. And and so Tomato would come to be entertained by that. And, uh, yeah, we would hang out at the Ivar Theater very often. And, um, okay, so on that note, uh, something that you mentioned either in the poem, well, you did mention it in the poem, uh, but something you just said a few minutes ago about their stage force almost reminding you of something like uh, an orchestra accompanying some sort of German expressionist presentation. Right. Um, Rossler talks about this in the interview, and I believe we talked about it at something like two, uh, Antony Artaud. Right, yes. And, uh, uh, theater um, of Cruelty. And you mentioned in your poem that you guys, uh, after... After a body afternoon with El Duce in what Jumbo's Clown? What was no, that I, the Ivar. The yeah. Ivar, right? Uh, you guys quickly made your way across the street to the what? Right, there was the Hollywood Library, where right across the street from the Ivar Theater. And one thing that Tomata and I had in common was our fascination with the theater 
of Antonin Artaud and the idea of the theater of cruelty. Yeah. The idea of that, you know, entertainment shouldn't be entertaining or soothing, but that it, you should confront the audience and, and awaken them right. with something harsh and, uh, you know, not, not just giving them some tranquilizing distraction and escapism, but actually wake them up. And, and that definitely informed my own performances in Radio Werewolf and to this day and Tomato was doing that with the screamer so we found a very rare book called Arto and After in the Hollywood branch of the library which we both uh co-stole and and shared so. I believe uh Arto referred to the actors on stage as being athletes of the heart correct uh, there's certainly something athletic about Tomato's uh uh, stage performance. Yeah, if you don't I mean, mind me saying. Oh, very much so. I mean, it was incredibly the energetic. Being burned. Yeah, he he would lose a lot of weight after every performance. It was incredibly intense and dynamic, and and he never, you know, he never that character he played on the stage. Actually, as I got to know him, honestly, I was a bit disappointed that he wasn't this maniacal person he played on stage. He was actually a very calm and gentle. And like I say, like an elf-like person, but this persona he created, um, you know, was very dynamic and strong, and and very much influenced. As you know, he nobody would admit this in the '70s, but he was a hippie, and he was influenced by hippie street theater and and Arto and and that kind of thing, and he brought all of that into this performance, right. So uh, that's something that you and Rossler get into a bit in the interview. Um, and speaking of that, uh, speaking uh, of that interview, um, I just wanted to say for myself, um, this would have been the second time that I, this is the second time that I interviewed Paul Rossler. Um, the interview for me was uh, certainly an experience being a number one Screamers fan and basically just a fan and aficionado of that entire period. Um, it was amazing for me to hear some of the things uh, straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, first person. Um, some stuff was jarring to me personally. Other stuff filled in some blanks. Um, I, if you don't know who Paul Rossler is, I think we got into this a little bit at the beginning. Uh, Paul Rossler, he's an old punk rock vet going back from day one. Uh, he was in The Screamers. He was in 45 Grave. He was in Twisted Roots. He was in... Nina Hagen Nervous, band. Nervous Gender. Yeah. And he's also got a solo project now. Um, and an album, I believe, freshly out. The Turning of the Bright World. Right, and The Turning... That is available on Bandcamp, Paul Rossler's latest album, and very different than what he was doing a thousand years ago in the early first wave of Hollywood punk, but still well worth listening to. And we will play a song from that after the interview. So um, it was an honor to talk to Paul. And he, he I would say, if you're interested in the Screamers, um, this is probably the most comprehensive interview from somebody who was deeply involved with it. Um, that you'll hear and we we got into the to the obscure details of what of how the screamers came together how they created music and why why their uh dominance of the la punk scene rose to an amazing degree and then faded just as quickly through through what happened with that movie yeah various self-destructive and self-sabotaging actions that have afflicted so many bands but yeah, I think, Paul, really, if you're interested in the Screamers, and also uh, a side issue, the Screamers were sort of inseparable from the Germs. I mean, they were the, the leading... They were totally opposite in every way, um, but Darby and Tomata were very good friends, and I I went to the same high school as Darby did a few years after, so we had that in common, among other things. So... Paul also gets into his friendship with Darby Crash. Um, and, you know, this was an incredibly tiny scene that was referred to in those days as the 100, because there were literally about 100 people involved with it at that time. So another interesting aspect of this interview we did with Paul is his description of his friendship with 
uh, Darby, he too went to uni high school, and so we all we all were part of this very strange high school, University High. So, with no further ado, I here's think, the interview. Yeah, this was pre-recorded, but this is our discussion with Paul Rossler, and so about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Right, and so we, and of course, we'd like to thank Paul for giving us his time thank you very and, much. and his insight. And uh, here we are, Paul Rossler and us discussing his career and his friendship with Darby Crash and his eventual involvement as the main keyboardist of the Screamers and beyond. Uh, hi, Paul. Adrian and Nicholas and Jason here in Berlin. Radio on. I'd like to welcome you to, a, to the show. As I mentioned, we want to ask you a few questions regarding the uh, semi-recent release. Um, as... I'm sure some people certainly do know uh, you have a colorful past. Uh, you were in the Screamers. Uh, you also were in 45 Grave for a bit. Also Nervous Gender, weren't you? And if I'm not mistaken, you also played for Nina Hagen for a while? For quite a while. Quite yeah. a while. Okay. Uh, and now you are in L.A. You have a recent album that came out about a year ago, a year and a half ago. And you, have a stu- and you have a studio with Geza X, is that correct? Is that where you are right now? Actually, I have a recording studio with, uh, with Josie Cotton called Kit and Robot. Okay. And uh, we opened up in 2011. And yeah, I'm sitting, sitting in here right now. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very nice. Beautiful. <laughs> uh-huh. and, uh, uh, it's, it's great. I've uh, had my own studio now for uh, 12 years, which I guess was... And then I, we had a we had a studio before that, and I guess that was my entire goal in life was to have my own studio, <laughs> so I could just. So actually, yes, I did just put out an album this year called "The Turning of the Bright World," which was um, it's out on Kitten Robot Records, and um, which I'm I, I'm really happy with because uh, I did I've done many many uh, records under difficult circumstances in, in my house and uh, going into studios really quickly and this time I really had a chance to settle in and make it the way I want it so um, so I think it's a good introduction to my own stuff um, uh, but yes having this studio for the last 12 years I've kind of I've actually put out about uh, 15 or 16 of my own records but uh, right sort on. of putting out everything that I'd ever recorded. And uh, so a lot of that stuff's just up on Bandcamp, but some of it's out on all the platforms. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. I've been, been really busy with my stuff, but also really, really busy producing a lot of other artists and playing with bands. So it's been a great, the last 12 years has been a, probably the most productive time of my life I've been I've been reflecting on recently. That, uh, Excellent. Mm-hmm. Now, it's cool to... Uh, after after 50 years doing music to just finally starting to hit my stride. <laughs> right. Now, when before you joined the Screamers, if we can go back to that phase of your career, uh, you wrote this very ambitious prog rock composition. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, I was, uh, I was studying classical piano and I was into the bands like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and Yes, and Jethro Tull. I think those were probably my three favorite. I was like, uh, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old. And then when I was 16, um, we uh, ba- I joined a band and uh, we decided we wanted to write a concept album like they were doing in 1975. So I, I wrote one and I had just been uh, taught music theory. So I was, it was, I was really on fire. Uh, and every, every bar sometimes is a different meter and i was really throwing everything into it um and then i finally when i got the studio i finally recorded it and put it out in 2012 it's called the arc Mm -hmm. and um, i mean it's it uh it's kind of crazy that that i did that i feel like i've i feel like there's some uh some you know it's a 16 year old's work so there's some uh, but it was fun to go back, and it was very challenging to try to uh, recreate that. Um, but yeah, that's what I was doing. I was working on that band in high school and performing it. And then one day, Darby came up to me. His name was Paul at the time. And he said, uh, me and Pat are starting a band. Me and George are starting a band. And I was like, wait a minute. 
uh, you guys don't play instruments. And of course, I was I was practicing 10 hours a day in high school. So I was very full of myself and my technique and my uh, my um, mastery of right. music. And I was you, you're not allowed to you're not allowed to start a band. Right. And uh, <laughs> and then Darby said to me, well, Pat can play all the yes songs. And I was like, I didn't even know Pat could play guitar. And um, sure enough, they started a great band, and within two years, they put out an incredible album. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that was uh, what, what interested me about <laughs> that is, is you know, the pretense in Hollywood punk was that it was all beginning from scratch, but actually, the influences, like with you, and you can even hear that in your screamers playing. There, there is a classical influence and a very traditional, you know, everything that punk rock was supposed to be the antidote to you guys were actually into yes and and the very baroque and elaborate so can you reflect on that a bit like how that traditional prog rock sound you know how did it come into hollywood or la punk rock well i think it's really uh, a really sort of an obvious connection if you think about the word progressive you know um and by 1977, most of those prog bands that I was really into, Jethro Tull and Yes and ELP, because I wasn't into the deep, deep prog music. Um, I was a kid. Right. But most of those bands had gotten really terrible. You know, they had over the five or six or eight years that they've been going, they had become really bloated and exhausted. And I actually quit rock music. There was there was literally by 1976, no rock music I was interested in. I mean, I liked I liked Bowie. Bowie was still doing some good work for sure. I mean, there were exceptions, but I felt I felt really alienated from rock music completely. So, you know, if you're looking for progression, you know, moving forward and not being stuck and repeating the same ideas and tropes, mm -hmm. you know, you start moving towards, um, you know, stripping things down or, or, or moving backwards. But um you know that was the amazing thing about about punk rock is you know by 1976 it seemed like rock music had been sort of exhausted and i think the the progression of punk rock was uh maybe reintroducing ideas it was it had a lot to do with ideas you know when bands like emerson lake and palmer and yes and jethro Tull, there was yes the music was complex and grandiose but there was also the ideas of we're not going to regurgitate blues licks and we're not going right. to regurgitate uh, Chuck Berry. We're going to um, explore King Crimson. I forget King Crimson right. as a really, you know, w can, uh, people like Brian Eno and um, and Robert Fripp had a lot of thought. Right. And, I, and I think punk rock, there was a lot of... Concept, a lot there of was a lot of conceptual foundation to it, yeah. Absolutely. So that is progressive, and that's tr that's the case in um, in the, the visual arts. Uh, you know, in the '60s and '70s, people have said, you know, representation is dead, and they go through color fields, and then eventually they get to concept conceptual art. And so I think punk rock, and that's why I think a lot of those bands did one album. They were art pieces. They were conceptual art pieces. A band like the Germs or the Screamers or or e even the Weirdos. It was a conceptual art piece, and really, the statement was made on the first record. Yeah, right. What, what was Darby going to do after that album? I mean, yeah, where was he supposed to go after that? Not musicians, really. You know, whereas Pat, by the time the Germs broke up, you know, I worked with Pat in Twisted Roots, and I worked on a solo record right. with him called Root Smear. Pat's love, a I love brilliant, that record. He's a brilliant musician, you know, and mm -hmm. he. He grew really quickly, you know, unlike me, I don't know how he got so good so fast there. I think there's such a thing, we call it, and it's sort of a loaded word, talent. But I think of talent only as something like where things come very, some people, things come very quickly to them. They learn very quickly and Pat grew so fast and he was playing in the adolescence and he was playing in Twisted Roots and he was playing in 45 Grave and he did his solo record. And it's no accident that he wound up being in Nirvana and um, Foo Fighters because he's a really, and he, I got him in the Nina Hagen Man for a while too. He's a really exceptional, uh, when you play with him, you know, it's a subtle thing what he does, but it's uh, really brilliant. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about that. Did you just say that you got Pat into the Nina Hagen Band? You brought him in? I did. Ah. Uh, 
we we had it. She, I was in her first American band um, after she fired um, the guys that started Spliff, and um, you know there was a lot of controversy in Germany about that. Um, and she came and she put together an American band, and then she had her baby, Cosma Shiva, in '83. So she took a little break, and when she came back, um, she, we put together a new band. And I had been playing with Pat, and I knew the thing about Pat is if you write a song. He'll come up with a part that's the that is the hook, you know. He'll come up with a guitar part that's the part you'll remember. He's such a, uh, but he's not a flashy like, um, you know. He doesn't. When you have a pra band practice, most a lot of guitar players they plug in and they start going oh, to yeah. show off <laughs> their chops, and you're like, wow, you're good. But Pat just sits there. He plugs in and he just sits there. And I think Nina's management were really uncomfortable. Um, with him they did not see uh what he brought to the table and uh it's a shame because i think that me and pat and nina would have would have made some really great records but there are a lot of pressures on nina from the outside because you know she was a big star and you're walking in you know there's a lot of people a lot of eyes are on you mm -hmm. and a lot you have a lot of people to answer to and nina has been always amazing at sort of telling um of do, following her own muse and doing whatever she wants but i feel like at that point the pressure um so they fired pat and they they, they, they fired, fired him, him. Uh, yeah they they got i know it sounds funny now but you have to remember at the time his only credit was the germs right <laughs> and, and her management was like what is this guy this weird punk rock guy you know I, they could get any i remember we were auditioning guitarists and robbie krieger came down and the guitarists from the beach boys they were getting the the best right. you know la session guys which is what they thought was right for her and it is true you listen to her first two records her music is pretty proggy you know it's right. not mm -hmm. it's not easy music by any stretch of the imagination so and the stuff she did with ferdinand on unsex monk rock was also dread love and those songs were are tricky but pat could play anything if you but um yeah, so, uh, you know, generally Nina is the last person to ever cave into pressure, but maybe she did that time. And and when they when they fired Pat, I just, I, I always felt strange playing with Nina because she was really a rock star and I was really coming out of this anti-rock star uh -huh. thing. And uh, for me, I always felt uncomfortable. I always felt weird being in the tour bus with bodyguards and and paparazzi it was it was uh it was awkward for me and so i actually when they fired pat i quit too and um went back to work on my own music and right. uh now, had kids right now if we can return to after you did your your prog rock teenage masterpiece then yes how, thank you keep yeah. on track <laughs> how did you how did you uh how did you get involved with the screamers did yeah they, yeah what what was the meeting point if you recall well you know uh first uh darby and pat you know invited me down to see their band at the whiskey and i went down and saw them and i saw the deadbeats and uh the germs together and um i was a class studying classical music and the deadbeats are a sort of zap zappa beefart esque um punk band so they did odd meters and they were had a super their drummer played like phil collins and genesis and they were uh, the one of the great unsung forgotten la punk bands the right. deadbeats i remember them out. yeah that wasn't a that wasn't a chris d band was it no no chris d's no, band that was, was called the, flesh the flesh, flesh the flesh eaters that i know right. but okay right right, right. right. Mm. deadbeats had a song called kill the hippies that they're kind of remembered for right. gaza was Gaza was in the Deadbeats. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I always thought, I always when I think of the LA punk scene, I think of the Germs, the Weirdos, the Screamers, and the Deadbeats are the first four, followed quickly by X and the Dickies and some other bands. But I love, I just love them. But it really made me feel like there's a place for me in the punk rock world. And my friends and I started a punk band that I drummed for. And um, what was that band called? And the uh, Wax. Okay. We only played a few of those. And I played drums in the controllers. I was a terrible drummer, but it was punk rock, so it was kind of okay. But um, the Screamers were look. The Screamers were the really the biggest, coolest band in town, and they were looking for a keyboard player. They had um, their original keyboard player, who plays on the record you guys are talking about, Dave, David, David Brown. David Brown. Yeah. Uh, he had. They had had a. They had had a some kind of falling out, and I I understand it because. 
I've met him a few times and I, I think he's I kind of worship David Brown's keyboard playing and I really really like him as a person but they definitely there was just too much talent in one band mm. and uh, and um, so they were looking for a keyboard player and um, I think it was Trudy who was one of the punk rock the plunger girls uh, who later married KK um, set up a, set up a meeting with me and Tommy gear and you know it was a very small scene so there wasn't a lot of candidates so I kind of just met with Tommy I think I actually met him for the first time when the screamers when the uh, sex pistols played Winterland which was early Jen, 78 I, I was at that concert January 14th mm -hmm. 1978 yep yeah that was the first meeting with him so they had been together for a little over a year at that point but they were sort of undeniable band you know they were the kind of band where you stood in front of them and you knew you were just uh seeing something that you had never seen before that was fantastic so i just told them i'm your new keyboard player um kind of getting around and uh and the thing is they were all quite a bit older than me you know they were in their mid-20s tomato was 30 i was still 18 i think right um so i was really uh i mean i had been doing music a lot so i was you know i had um musical chops but um they were like really smart really quick really um uh, funny and uh you know they had very well read and um so i was i was uh really just stepping into some really big shoes and just trying to trying to like fulfill my role you know, for, and did you did you contribute musically to songwriting, or or did Tommy Gear pretty much take care of the musical side of things? Tommy wrote most of the music. By the by the end of it, I wrote a, a couple pieces. There Which was a piano you? piece. Excuse me. Uh, I go for you. There's a piano piece that I wrote um, for the uh, the last phase when they were kind of working on the movie and they were doing. The one thing about the Screamers, it evolved so quickly. You know, the first year I was in the band, we were the classic Screamers four-piece punk band, and then by the by the by the end of it, we had backing tapes, and we had a girl that would come out. Well, I, and I remember the, uh, at the Whiskey seeing two shows with Sheila, the singer that, Sheila, that was brought in. Violins. It was a dramatic change, and um, and that was like one of the amazing things about them is they never wanted to do the same thing two shows in a row and they evolved so quickly um but really i don't think they even really wanted to be a band they wanted to evolve beyond being a band they wanted to be a production company and uh a a, a, a you know a, a site with a recording studio and they wanted to really get the band was kind of for those guys was a means to an end and sometimes that feels really um like that should be that should come off as really like poser like and and phony but in a way it gave them a distance from their art which uh you know someone like like bowie or certain people like bands like the beatles you you realize there's this cynicism they're not confessional they're not even emotionally invested in their music which is a which is a thing that i became really into much later in the 90s i really got involved in confessional singer songwriter um, personal music mm -hmm. but a band like the Screamers or someone like David Bowie to an extent are they're more like constructing a, uh, a, a presentation you know it's almost like Broadway it's a right. whole different well, when I when I got to know Tomata I was shocked actually the difference between the onstage persona of that Screamers person he was and the human being he was it was jarring how different they were well, and it makes sense because he came out of you know experimental theater. Right. Well, we were so we it, talked about Artaud a lot, Antonin Artaud, and the and the theater of cruelty and confronting the audience. So, so they gave me that they gave me that book to read. That was oh, part of my oh, okay. part of my class. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I think was the big inspiration with at least Tomata. So were there personal issues that you witnessed? I mean, why did the whole project fall apart with all of their ambitious plans for the music of the future and and certainly people appreciated it why were there personal issues that that led to the dissolution well it, it's you know i mean i can talk about it but i'm not sure that i'm the best person to talk about it because like i said i was i was 19 years old 
you know, and um, I was very much a teenager. I was actually a sheltered 19 year old in, in a lot of ways because I had um, been just practicing piano, <laughs> like, you know, so uh, I was pretty overwhelmed by um, the punk scene and with traveling and just trying to just trying to, you know, to um, take in a lot of information, like, for example, our toe, but a lot of writing. Um, I think they were influenced by, you know, winning through intimidation, like a lot of books and stuff that, I, you know, so I will say that they brought in a, um, a Dutch director um, named Rene Dalder, mm -hmm. and he got funding. Uh, they had uh, financial backers. And they built a, a sound stage and a recording studio, and they started working on this movie. And um, you know, I have heard that uh, you know, and I, I, I there was not a lot of um, protecting the screamers or treasuring the screamers because they they were really wanted to be making movies, you know, and and move on. I think Tomatoes Health. I think. I think those performances that you see Tomato doing were incredibly grueling for him, mm -hmm. you know, and the idea of him being able to tra to tr transform into an actor, you know, he was, he later transformed into an artist. I really don't think he was dying to be the lead singer from a band. And, um, and I think that, uh, I think the director, um, I, I believe he put a wedge between Tommy and Tomato, you know, he, he uh -huh. hired KK. Directors are, I believe he did, but I can't say I, I witnessed that, you know. So um, I've always I've done interviews where I've I've sort of glibly, you know, said my opinions. Right. But um, you know, I I think that there was this, and then you know the problem was, to me the problem was you you got this fantastic recording studio and you started working on this music this movie, and the problem is that stuff wasn't very good no the movie's the movie, terrible it's terrible the movie's I mean, not it's, good yeah I mean I find it unwatchable I've never gotten all the way through it nor I and I and I think the music itself like suffered dramatically so you know but you know everything was going to their their plan but um, and it's it's kind of I think the screamers were this. Uh, the reason it was so there's this synergy that happened between you know the the invention of punk rock uh, of British punk rock '76, this culture sort of designed by John Lydon and Malcolm McLaren, and I mean I see them having a lot to do with it, but this sort of immediate mushroom cloud of um, fashion and style. And, um, and and Tommy and Tomato and KK t come together, and and um, there's a sum. Uh, the sum is greater than the parts. You know, mm -hmm. it's like three very objective people going, okay, punk rock's the next big thing. We'll start a punk rock band. How do you do punk rock? We'll do it like this. No guitars. All very contrived. Right. Contrived is usually a bad word. You know. Right. Well, in a, um, but, in a sort of Warholian way. I mean, Tomata had been in New York, and and he, exactly. I think, he knew very much how the Velvet Underground were put together as an art piece. So yeah, some, yeah, it was something more like performance art than a band per se, which is why they were good, actually. I, ex exactly, and and but I think that when I think Renee Dollar's influence was. I think it was less modern, you know. I mean, I saw a movie he made that was kind of a B movie. It was very, very Dutch because uh, I I lived in in a, a Dutch island in the Caribbean, so I kind of was exposed to Dutch culture. And there's a there's a teenager. The Dutch just love their precocious teenagers, like Kofia, Tintin, and and um. So his movie was kind of this precocious teenager movie. I remember Renee Dalder saying, "We're going to make this movie, and it's going to be about America. It's going to be we're going to we're going to make this movie about America." And I was like, "What are you, Bruce Springsteen? Like that to me is like that to me is a, a terrible concept for the Screamers, you know? Right. I mean, right. Actually, the Screamers were very European and very consciously so. They were not very American at all. Yeah, 
and and or even futuristic or even global you know um so uh but you know so he had this concept we're gonna we're gonna tell the story of america and i mean wow so you have this you have all this this synergy of the original ideas and now these these new ideas come in and it it just didn't work and it um toppled over it i don't know exact i think there was a a falling out between um, renee and tomato and tommy at some point but i can't say i know the details right. of it and did you were you i mean was there actually a real dramatic announcement we're breaking up or it just drifted apart and you stopped working with them yeah it was kind of a the death of a thousand cuts they they uh i was um it, you know, it, yeah, it really. sort of slowed down, and then uh, they were kind of working on the movie, but they weren't asking me to participate in it. They didn't. Have, I remember they brought in a guy named Leo Hero, who is a k- keyboard player, and he was writing music. And I was like, "I'm right here, guys, and and uh, Tommy's right there." And you know, wouldn't it? Wouldn't the respectful? If you had any um, consideration for what you are, are building on from the screamers, wouldn't you be asking? why would you bring in you know other people because they didn't even ask me and i don't know why i mean uh i think i could have i had written <laughs> i'd written some music i feel like i could have done well, it you were you were probably the most accomplished musician technically around and so. you know i could have really used guidance i could have really, but i'll tell you you know i was also very punk rock headstrong somewhat arrogant and I didn't really like Rene very much. You know, I didn't feel valued by him. We quick, pretty quickly mm-hmm. had, uh, had, had, and you know, by 1980, they were doing the Palace of Variety and Nina, Nina came and find, found me in the summer of 1980 and I was off on a new, on a right. new adventure. Did, uh, did you happen to know the other Screamers keyboard player, um, Jeff McGregor? Yeah. I did know him and I thought he was, I thought he was good, you know. I I didn't really see why they absolutely needed to replace him, but I, for some reason, he was always an interim, temporary member, and they were looking for someone to be permanent. So right. it might have been that he was still in high school or something like that. He might have still yeah, been. Yeah, I school. I knew him. You know, we were much younger than other people in that scene. So yeah, I just wondered if you had interaction with him. Too. I mean, he seemed like a, a, a not only a, a sweet guy, like smart, and he seemed like he played fine. He had his own his own image. He was play, tended to play sitting down and looking very like Lurch. Right, <laughs> but, right. Um, and he had a but, band uh, later he, called Interpol, I believe, that was pretty good. Oh, is that his band? I know yeah. he had the Snob Puppers. I didn't right, know that was the one he was in at the same time as the Screamers, but then he had a kind of futuristic-ish post-punk band. So is there... Yeah, Yeah, I have a question about the Screamers' music. Um, Whose idea was it to incorporate only keyboards? Only keyboards. Well, you know, like I said, I was not... I wasn't there in the founding of it. Mm -hmm. So um, I kind of stepped into this thing that was fully formed, and I get a lot of... um, a lot of attention for having been in that band, but I I don't deserve much credit. You know, I, I deserve the credit of being able to step in and carry my weight. Mm-hmm. But the conceptualization was fully formed. So, um, you know, I guess, you know, they had KK and Tommy and David Brown. Maybe there just wasn't a guitar player around. Right. You know? <laughs> they, okay. They, they have guys. So I can't, I can't. Sir. Okay. Another, another th- question I had is... Uh, when I knew Tomata, he was rather secretive about his past as a hippie and a drag queen and all of that. And I only learned that like in the early 80s when I got to know him more in the po- a little bit, little by bit. But did you find that too? Like he sort of concealed he was an out and out hate Ashbury hippie and drag queen and all of that. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the screamers were really secretive about everything. Right. That you know? was my impression. They, uh, and which was so, you know, I always say that the most, I think that the most important thing about punk rock today, a punk rock musician still making music like I am at my age is authenticity. And the screamers, <laughs> no authenticity whatsoever. Right. So it just tells you there's an exception to every rule. No authenticity. Um, and Tomato was, he wouldn't, he didn't want anyone to know his age. 
He didn't want anyone to know his real name. Yeah, I never um, knew those things at the time at all. Well, we, you know, I punk rock, it was really interesting because you, you start a new movement like that and then people go, okay, we started this big new movement and we love it, it's exploding. But what exactly are, are our um, aesthetics? What are our aesthetics? And right. I remember um, Kickboy Face from Slasher Magazine was Bessie. sort of a uh, philosopher, Claude Bessie. And I think uh, John Lydon's interviews and people like Joe Strummer were, were their interviews. We we're all reading them and trying to, and I think Malcolm was pulling some, you know, bringing situationalism and stuff like that. But um, are, are it's punk rockers, it's sort of gritty. Are we, are people homophobic? Are we right wing? Are we left wing? Are we, right. Johnny Rotten, are we pro drugs? Are we anti drugs? Right. Eventually, you know, people are like, well, anything goes really. You know, none of those things. Right. This is a bigger umbrella than any of those things, you know. Well, now people, uh, people, you know, misinterpret punk rock as being kind of woke and liberal and left wing. But one thing that I think would make people uncomfortable, Tommy Gear and Darby were very much into the idea of mind control and persuade, you know, almost totalitarian thinking. At least they pushed that kind of thing. Did you did you experience that? with them well i think tommy's coming from a, an advertising perspective and advertising is mind control uh advertising you you want to make people do something they don't necessarily need or want to do right you know everybody if you didn't need to mind control and advertising everybody would just buy what they needed and you wouldn't have to advertise the idea is to get those people that don't need things to buy them right so so tommy was coming from those darby was to me the most apolitical person i've ever known his only interest in fascism was the idea that he wanted people to worship him that's you know, well, that, that seemed like a common thread with tommy and in different ways like they wanted to create a movement of some kind well to, uh darby um was with high school he was much more interested i think in being an l ron hubbard type right he wanted to he was more interested in so i think it was more this you know bandy about words like uh narcissism narcissism and i mean i i, I saw one of my teachers last year and i asked him uh, they he's they're doing a documentary on him his name is caldwell williams he was one of the founders of yeah, the special yeah, yeah, yeah. read about him in the uh, book Oh, he's doing a documentary, and I saw, met him, and he's in his 80s. He's just a wonderful, kind man. He's had this incredible, incredible life. And uh, after they interviewed me about him, I couldn't resist. We're done interviewing, and I said, do you remember Paul Beam? And he goes, oh, sure. And we had a whole conversation about him. <laughs> and, you know, I, the, my greatest memory of him is that he was, as far as pure intelligence, probably the most intelligent person I ever met, you know. Um at least that was my impression. When I asked Caldwell, "What, um, w what can you say about him?" Caldwell said, "Well, he was a very, very sick kid, and it really, it really reminded me, you know. And clearly, he was because you know he didn't survive his twenty-second year, mm -hmm. so um, or his twenty-third year. So, um, you know, I, I get real. I've always gotten really hung up on what he accomplished and how amazing he was to be around, but." Um, uh, so anyway, I, I'm I'm digressing about Darby and, and Jeton Damone and I are working on a, a classical symphony right now, a goth a goth opera, believe it or not. And we're really, you know, it's a lot about a lot of references to Roz and Darby. And and there's a piece in the middle of it. It's about a half hour long. In the middle of it, there's a piece called Funeral. We put the piece called Funeral in the middle of the opera because the, what it's really about is surviving. You know, and and what what those people missed through their suicide, and um, how do you get through the things that Darby and Roz and some people didn't get through? You know, what mm -hmm. are the what are the what are the um, tools and the so um, so I don't think there's a I back to the politics of punk rock. Um, I think that punk rock is a, um, it's a generational paradigm shift it's not a political movement and mm -hmm. you have you have right-wing punkers and you had left left-wing punk workers and you always did 
But what I really want to tell you is I've recorded, a, I've continued to record punk rock to this day. And I'm recording a punk band tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And they're from the folk punk scene. And the folk punks are the the wokest of the woke you know they don't want to use they don't want to use electricity they want to use it uh they they are um many of them are are gay and trans many many of them are sober many of them are um family family oriented Mm -hmm. and um and uh they kind of laugh at us they they give us credit for having done this shift but they are so they have um they have progressed, you know. They they look, they look at our hideous warp tours, and you know, and wonderful as we were, they have taken it. Um, you know, there's a there's an exploration in punk rock of morality. Part of part of punk rock has always been very moralistic, mm-hmm. and um, and I only will tell you that uh, that I believe that the the youth has taken it far further. And have, have the progressive, we started with the word progressive. I think that the young kids who are punks who are doing this uh, very, very woke version of it are have just continued to, to progress to progress it. Mm-hmm. Um, real quick, Paul, we're almost out of time. Yeah, I just mm-hmm. wanted to ask you something very, very quickly. Um, since I've ever known about the Screamers, I've always heard about dealings you may or may not have had with the record industry this idea about putting together sort of a video album and I heard something about you guys going to Capitol Records and it was this more of a situation where you guys sat there and said, okay, well, what are you going to do for us? You know, it's not a case of we doing something for you. What are you going to do for us? Did this ever actually happen? Is there any truth to any of this? I wasn't in on that meeting because I was, I was the baby in the band, but we can go back to 1979. There's no MTV and um, I know that the big... The big fear with the screamers, or the big consideration, was that um, the sound, and particularly Tomato's voice, would never translate to radio. Mm-hmm. And radio was the it, it, at that time radio really had a stranglehold. It was like if you can't be on the radio, you can you can never. That was how the business worked. Uh-huh. The music business worked was you get on the radio and then you tour, and that was the only option. And um, and I think they had a point. I remember when we first played New York, the other band that hit New York right at the same time, and both of us like just killed it. Who was, um, that? was the B fifty two? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So the B fifty twos and the Screamers hit New York, and both of us, New York was just going crazy for both of us. Now the B fifty twos kind of translated to to radio, yeah. you know. And it's funny to put those two bands maybe in the same category, but you could see the contrast. Um, what would you have had to do to the Screamer sound? And I think that was one of the things they did when they created the um, the recording studio. They recorded a song called "The Scream" and "Why the World," and they were seeing what what it would what they could make that might translate to radio. And this all sounds very, again, cynical and uh, contrived, but I think it became pretty evident that. Um, it's it's barely music right. <laughs> the band is barely music and and so i can imagine saying t- going to a record uh, to a record company and saying what are you going to do for us because we're, we're not you know we're going to have to d- d- use ex- yeah. extreme measures to break this band and and the the idea of wanting to maintain the visual component it's really valid and possibly a requirement for people to uh to get on a wire. Okay. Yeah, on a wire. So does that explain why an album never came out? Well, again, there's also yeah, perhaps, you know, there was no um you know, I have reverence for those songs, reverence for the music, reverence for those performances. And I'm so grateful that there were a few documentations like Target, and that there are a few people that stood there and saw it. Um, but there was there was no reverence among you know even with Tomato and Tommy, it was there was nothing. I mean, Tommy actually made Gaza erase the demos that we recorded, wow. erase them, hmm. which is why the 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 demos that were recorded in my garage 
are um, all have this poor quality because they came off of cassettes that people had. Why did he make Gaza erase them? No reverence. You know, there. I've met some artists like this who want to destroy their art. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, I never really understood. I, I, um, um. You know, it must be a postmodern thing that I've never, never gotten. But uh, yeah, he actually made him erase those recordings. So there, there was a degree of self-sabotage into why they didn't make it on the higher level that everyone thought they could. I mean, perhaps, you know, this this kind of analysis, like if I was a fly in the wall for every single thing that ever happened, but I think there was also uh, a, a great ambition like in order to do what they accomplished you have to bring in business people you have to bring in tommy and tomato and kk on their own could not create a soundstage a production company a film company you need money people you need more talent right, right. the thing is when you bring in more talent it dilutes the the central personality of it right and it's gonna it's gonna begin to so um you know the talent they brought in really uh, was they brought in that money to fulfill the vision of being a production company and not a band and a film studio and not a band which is great they could be virgin records now is there anything that you think now that we've discussed the whole conceptual nature of the screamers and how i think it's very helpful for people to understand it wasn't really meant to be a band in any traditional sense it, it was a broader avant-garde art piece is there any particular anecdote or anything you can remember that seems to you like that quintessentially captures that whole period of your life working with the Screamers? Well, you know, I, I remember uh, the first time we were the first L.A. punk band to get to New York. And um, there was a uh, we, we arrived there and we realized goodness there's a there's a new york la rivalry we didn't even know <laughs> um and so there was a lot of new yorkers going los angeles um and of course they are... and they were very much a part of the new york scene tommy and and tomata right. i mean tomata had opened with blondie and the ramones at cb EBs before that so, yeah, yeah at our shows I, I met joey was there and we we had thanksgiving dinner at debbie's house and it was yeah wow. but <laughs> but there was a lot of uh sort of snobby new york people going oh everything in los angeles is plastic and i was thinking like i think now like to this day like what punk bands from new york do i really love can't think of any mm -hmm. but um right. so anyway uh but we got there and um we were playing CBGBs and we did our show. It went great. There were people from the Heartbreakers. There's all this stuff. And then they decided we were going to do a, a party, a loft party that night. That night we were going to play a loft party. And, um, um, you know, <laughs> so I was somewhat on autopilot. Things were happening so fast back in those days. So um, we show up, we play the loft party, and there are a thousand people. It's just. Um, uh, insane and we play and you know like every screamer show the the because we were talking about it the conceptualization you know the conceptualization is everything they conceived that band in such a way that every time we walked on stage it worked mm -hmm. well, and i've been in a lot of bands i've been in a lot of bands and i've played with nina hagen and i've played with her where we got five encores and they were still screaming when we left. There were other nights when it didn't work, mm -hmm. you know? Right. The screamers, for some reason, every time we played, it was very magical. Mm -hmm. There was just something, it was the the best live band I've ever played with. Just, it was just conceived in such a completely visionary and unique way that it always worked. So uh, I just remember like, that show which someone had thrown together at three o'clock in the afternoon and maybe that's more of a story about new york mm -hmm. that you know like when the buzz is out there the new yorkers just show up and uh they were they were snooty to us but uh we i really felt like we we conquered new york and that was very exciting and i think uh we also went and saw a a theater pr uh performance some big gay theater thing and i saw klaus nomi perform an aria and uh 
and it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. And uh, up until then, I was a nerdy kid in a practice room. And starting when I joined the Screamers, I got to see things like Klaus Nomi. And uh, I had a, a series of incredible experiences right. with them. The wow. fi final thing like in, along the same line of playing at the Loft Party, were you involved with the Iggy Pop living room performance? In no, that was before. That, that was before, before your time. Okay. The flip side of that New York Loft Party was on that same tour, we played Pittsburgh. And I remember we ran out of money and Tomato went to the store and he bought bread, Wonder Bread and bananas and peanut butter. And we all had... <laughs> Banana and peanut butter sandwiches so we wouldn't starve to death. Right. Well, Elvis, Elvis had just died, so everyone knew about banana and peanut butter sandwiches in that year. So that was, that was was that's kind of been the story of my life, the highs and the lows. Right. I always say that the punk rockers, we got just enough fame to keep us insane for the rest of our life, and they didn't pay us for it. Right. But I'm right. lucky because I landed in this, in this studio, and I get to make music. It's been now... 15 or 20 years I've done nothing but make music and uh, somehow I uh, I got lucky, you know? I'll well, say. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your um, your, your, in your memories of all that. Wait, 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 one more. Real yeah. quick, do you still talk to those guys at all? Do you have any contact to KK, with KK or with Tommy? Do you guys it's, eat? It's funny that you ask because about a month ago, um, Elvez, who is this, was uh, right. Robert Lopez, who was the singer from the Zeros, the first probably punk band of any of them. Um, he does a, he did a tribute to the Screamers at a club called uh, Zebulon, uh, right down the street, and I went, and KK and Tommy were there. Oh, oh wow, wow! Mm -hmm. So the three of us were in a room for the first time in probably forty years, and. Um, it was just so delightful to catch up to Tommy. He was such a different person than I remembered. He seemed so sweet. And then we started talking about what he's doing now. And he's doing, he's a consultant in these very avant-garde art installations. And as usual, he just seemed like a, you know, thousand times smarter than me. And I felt like a little kid around him. And um, <laughs> and then KK uh, just had his 70th birthday party and he threw a party. And uh, whenever he throws these parties, there's a million people and we, we throw together a band. So KK and I got up there, I, I jo played in the band. We did a lot of very silly covers, like Walking in the Sand and, uh, you know, uh, just really ridiculous covers. But one of the covers we did was Punisher Be Damned. Oh, wow. And we got Great. to jump up and sing. And, and it was the same thing as it always was. KK and I, KK starts that beat and I start playing those notes and we're heroes. It, right. It's this very odd thing. It takes no effort whatsoever. You start playing the Screamer song and, um, and uh, the audience is just there in the palm of your hand. So yeah, it, it's been a Screamers month, actually. It's funny Good to hear. To hear that. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you for hanging out with us. <laughs> Bye. We'll, we'll talk to you Bye. again. Thank you. Can't wait. Okay, okay man. Bye. Take care. Have a good day. Ciao, ciao. All right. There you go. That was our interview with Paul Rossler. Uh, and as we mentioned before the interview, we wanted to play for you a song of his. It is called Maker. And this song is uh, uh, from taken from the album, The Turning of the Bright World. It is available on Bandcamp. This is Paul Rossler and Maker.
Okay, everybody. Uh, so that was the interview. That was some of Paul Rossler's music. Thank you all very much for tuning in. This is Radio One Berlin. I'm Jason Honey. I am the shitty listener, a.k.a. Boy True. And uh, sitting next to me is... I am Nicholas Shrek, and thank you for tuning in as well. And uh, to experience the screamers, you really need to see what they looked like. So if you're not familiar with them, I would recommend looking online... Uh, at some of the videos that were made for Target Video. They capture some of the dynamic nature of what the live Screamers experience was. So thank you all for listening, and good night. And just so you know, we were talking to Paul Rossler live and direct from his Kitten Robot Studios in Los Angeles, California. Thanks. You have been listening to Radio 1 Berlin with Jason Oney and Nicholas Schreck interviewing Paul Rossler from The Screamers. For more information, visit www.radioonberlin.com and download our podcasts on all major platforms. I'm Adrian Shepard and wishing you, wherever you are, a peaceful day. Thank you for listening.